you're not in here for this presentation, then enjoy it, I guess. Um, my name is Geerling Guy, or Jeff Geerling, and uh, I've been using Drupal for about nine years, uh, Ansible for about four years. I've been involved in a lot of different things in, in open source, but mostly in those two communities. Uh, I also work for Acquia, started working there a couple years ago. Um, I also write a lot. I wrote quite a bit to make a book, and I still uh, I'm, I do a lot of blogging, write for many different uh, places. And one of my passions in the software world is to automate, so automating processes and automating builds and automating basically anything. I also like to try to find ways to automate the rest of my life, but uh, oftentimes it's impossible, like with sleep. Uh, so, but I'll give you tips, I guess, for how, how to automate those kind of things, too. Um, and uh, I, I've been highly involved in Drupal, but in terms of uh, notoriety, uh, I've been compared to Dave Reed, but in the Ansible community. Uh, for those who don't know, Dave Reed is, uh, he's, he's not quite as crazy as he used to be in terms of his Drupal module contributions, but he used to maintain something like 50 or 100 modules and a lot of them in like the top 50, so it's pretty crazy. Um, I, I maintain a lot of open source projects, and uh, a lot of them are widely used. It, you know, there are, I think, 10 or so that are over a few hundred stars on GitHub, and there's lots of forks, there's lots of, there's lots of activity. And um, a lot of people ask me a lot of times, like, how do you do all those things and have a family and write and do all these other things? Like, the, I, I don't think it's too crazy the way that I do things. I'm going to tell you about how I do it and some tips. Um, but um, I, I think a lot of people feel feel that it's a daunting task. But it's kind of like all the other sessions on the imposter syndrome. It, you you might feel that until you start doing it, and then you realize it's it's just one of the priorities in my life, and I can schedule it, and I can do things with it, and uh, be productive because of the, some of the things I do. My claim to fame is that I'm the highest ranked open source contributor in St. Louis. But, you know, I, I guess uh, if I stay in the Midwest, I have a good chance of, of keeping that. But over on the coast, probably not, not anywhere near that. Um, but open source is actually just a small part of my life. Uh, that besides this week at DrupalCon, there's no times in my life really that I spend more than an hour or two a day doing anything open source. Uh, I'm a husband and a father of three kids, all under the age of five. Things get pretty crazy at home. This is a, a common ritual in the Geerling household. It's the changing of the diaper genie. And uh, as the kids are getting older, uh, one of them's not in diapers and the other two still have productive uh, bowels and things like that. So. There are things like blowouts and explosions of things that you'd rather not be touching. And this often happens at the most inopportune times. Uh, I also deal with meltdowns and I, I have activity time and, and uh, family game night, all these different things that I, it's, it's really important to me. And uh, I think most people that have families, probably all of us uh, to some extent or another, the family is a driving uh, a driving issue for why we do what we do in open source and in our work and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I also have a passion for photography. Before I was a web developer, I, uh, I was both doing video and photo and some media work, and that's kind of actually what got me into Drupal because I was doing videos and photos and uh, I needed a place to put all that stuff to share with people in my college, and I found this awesome thing called Drupal with a module that lets you upload files. And I went to town on it, and I think that site actually still exists. It's using the Garland theme, or I, I think that was Drupal 5, I don't remember. Maybe it was Drupal 6, but anyway, it, it led me into Drupal, and I still do a lot of photography, but it's mostly of my kids and birds and things like that, since I don't, I don't have the, the time to be able to devote to it otherwise. And I, I still do it here at events like this. I, I like to share that gift that I was given to be able to have a nice camera and to be able to take a picture and it's not blurry, that kind of thing. Um, so I enjoy photography. I also enjoy um, not making drugs. I'm building, I'm building an office. Uh, this was when I was building an office in my house for, uh, for my Acquia job. It's, it's a remote job, so I needed a place to stay and, and work. That was removed away from the kids who can 
kind of distract. Uh, and I like doing things like uh, building and, and remodeling and uh, light gardening, even though if you talk to any of my plants, they're all perennials when I buy them, but they seem to turn into annuals at the end of the season. <laughs> Every year I have to replant all of them. So, um, And the last thing that, that I, that's, uh, has a big impact on my life is I have Crohn's disease. So uh, it affects me on a daily basis almost every day of my life since I've, I've had it. Uh, in this picture, this was a few months ago, I, was, I had my first surgery. A lot of Crohn's patients have one, two, three, many surgeries to assist with it. Um, I'm doing fine right now. You can see I'm standing up. I'm not, I'm not uh, on morphine or whatever that was. Uh, but uh, one of the things that this has taught me, and also raising kids and all these things, all the things that I do has taught me that the people that I work with in open source, the people filing issues, uh, the people who submit pull requests and patches, uh, I have to have compassion for them. I don't know what they're going through. If, if I didn't show you this picture and you saw me in the hallway, you might not even know that I have Crohn's disease. There's a lot of illnesses, there's a lot of mental issues, there's a lot of um, relationship issues that you'll never see it uh, because people are good at masking it and hiding it. And, uh, or it's something that's just under the surface. So I always try to treat everyone uh, like I would want to be treated. And, and the point of that is that all of us, the maintainers of open source projects, contributors, uh, the people who really get on your nerves, we're all people, we're all in this together. We all have human needs and desires. Uh, you know, I, I have things going on in my life that, that affect the way, the way that I do my work and the time that I have for my work. And uh, it's important for me to be able to, to somewhat compartmentalize that. And... Um, and do things, do things in a way that supports the rest of my life and doesn't tear it down. Um, and really, a lot of times when there's burnout, when there are issues uh, that cause somebody to leave a community or to stop doing some sorts of development, it's because of the other things in their life getting impacted negatively. And open source is not seen as something supporting that. Therefore, open source is the first thing to go. Um, so. This presentation, the, the whole point of it is I want to show some of the ways that I, I make sure that my open source work is uh, supportive of the rest of my life and also the rest of my life can support my time doing open source as well. So this pie chart shows my average day and uh, anybody who, who has a significant other who's an engineer, programmer, that kind of thing, they, they realize that uh, you compartmentalize your life just like you, you have the food on your plate separated because you can't, you can't have things mixing up. You have to have nice categories for everything. Uh, most of my day is spent either working, uh, getting my W-2, or sleeping. So already a, a large chunk of my day every day, at least on weekdays, is uh, spent doing things that aren't supporting that family life necessarily. There, there's things that can help with it, but it's not something that directly impacts uh, my ability to uh, to be with my family and uh, grow in love with them and everything. Uh, I also do things like eat. Uh, it's necessary, unfortunately, for our, our growth and, and potential. Um, someday we'll figure out a way to automate that. Uh, and then I also, well, it, it says read there, but it's really, that's the time that I binge on Netflix, uh, read some Reddit, uh, Facebook, those kind of things. Um, and there's this little sliver of time left. It's about one, one to one and a half hours in my daily life. And that's the time that I dedicate to open source work. Um, so like I said, it's, that's usually the first wedge that will get consumed by something else. If your work, if you're being overworked or if you're having family issues, uh, hopefully not, not eating for more than three or four hours a day. Um, but you know, if, if you have issues and, and you're spending too much time uh, browsing the web or, or doing things that aren't really helpful towards your own family, your own life, all that kind of stuff. The open source is usually the part of the wedge that gets closed up first. And uh, so I, I want to go into this, uh, the, the ideas that I have by showing you, here's what my typical day uh, starts off like when I'm gonna do some open source work. So the kids are in bed, uh, I, am, I have my hour or so of free time without having uh, them kind of going all over the place. Anytime that I'm at my computer, they will flock to it and start to hit the keys and things. So um, once they're in bed, I have about one to one and a half hours. 
So I'll open up my email and uh, click on my open source folder and uh, yikes, there's, there's a lot of unread notifications. Uh, obviously I doctored this a little bit, I kind of just marked them all as unread so that I'd have a cool screenshot. Usually though there's, there's you know, between 30 to 100 messages on a given day and uh, it, it's a daunting queue. So, you know, today I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll go to GitHub instead and see, like, what, what are the things going on just there. I'm going to ignore Drupal and ignore some of the other issue queues. Just GitHub. And maybe I won't even do that. That's, that's just too much. It's an overload. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right in and find an issue to start working on. And this one, this one actually looks pretty good. Uh, there's, there's some good things about this here. I, I think tonight's, tonight's looking pretty good. First of all, this person added a description uh, that had all the reasoning behind the change. It shows me, uh, it even links to some documentation saying like this is why this is a good idea. It explains the small change that is in there very well so that I don't have to spend time thinking about what's going on. Uh, so if you're somebody who contributes to open source, take some mental notes here. These are the things that get your things merged in quickly. Uh, it also has one small change that's only 14 lines of code. Uh, that's really nice. That, that means that I can click over to the files change, look at the patch or look at the changes, and I'm going to be able to keep them into my head so I can see, oh, is this a good thing, is it a bad thing? Um, and uh, it also has one commit, so that means that either they were doing a lot of work and they cleaned up their commits into one commit, uh, and also I, I don't have it in here, but the, the commit message described what was going on, so that's good. All these things are great signs. And it even t passes the automated test. This is great. So um, if you're ever submitting a patch, uh, submitting a pull request, these are the kind of things that maintainers love to see. So I, I merged it. You can see it's merged up there. And today's going really well. This is like, I'm going to finish 10 issues at least, maybe 20. Um, but then reality is going to hit. And uh, I start finding these other issues. Uh, it's actually, you know, I, the next issue in the issue queue has been open for six weeks and nobody's ever responded. Uh, another issue is, has been open for a year and a half and I, I replied and said, hey, can you try doing this? And he never responded. And then the third one has been open for four days and it's, it's something that's answered in the documentation and I linked to it and they never responded. Uh, so. Uh, these, are, these issues um, and some other types are very common in my issue queues and I'm sure in many of yours and uh, I'm going to introduce you to some of the characters uh, of these issue queues. This one is the Ghost Rider when the original poster just up and leaves, disappears from the planet, you never hear from, again, from them again um, and like if you look at Drupal Core's issue queue you're going to find probably thousands of these. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it, there, there are good excuses for why it happens, but uh, if a maintainer comes back with a, a question or something, I always try to follow up. And, and if, if they've answered my problem or if they've fixed it or something, I will close it since I posted it. Uh, and that, that way my issue queue can be a little cleaner. There's also three other types of issue. Uh, the see no docs, read no docs, and fix no docs. See no docs I already described, I'll give somebody a link and uh, it's obvious that they don't read them because they reply again and say, no, this isn't working. And I'm like, well, if you take your error message and paste it here, then here's the answer, like, just do it. Um, and then the read no docs is uh, when you, when you uh, put them in and, um, uh, actually that was read no docs, sorry, I'm flipped. See no docs is when like the first page of your readme or documentation says do X and they do Z and they wonder why it's not working. And then last is fix no docs where somebody says, hey, this documentation line is wrong and then uh, the issue kind of sits out there forever and nobody ever fixes it and you as the maintainer don't care too much because it doesn't affect you uh, but if somebody would put up a pull request and just put a one line sentence in there saying what it is, it would be merged immediately. So these issues sit out there forever. Um, these issues are very dangerous as, uh, as people on the Titanic discovered. Icebergs are issues uh, that it's a tiny patch or a tiny issue uh, or something that seems really simple and then you realize an hour and a half later when it's time for bed uh, that all of your open source time is gone for the day and you just looked at one issue and it was something simple like a one line change. Um, and 
you know, at the end of it, you're thinking, man, if I would have known that, I just wouldn't have touched this issue. I would have left it off for some other time. So those are the icebergs. And uh, if you're a maintainer, you've probably seen lots of these. The person who prods you to merge uh, an old patch that, that's passing tests or something. Uh, these, these I call the for shamer. A lot of times there's a little passive aggressive undertone of why haven't you merged this or hey, it looks like this is great, please merge it. Now, a lot of times these are well intentioned, uh, but I, I guess my advice for somebody posting an issue is uh, try to think of what your language is saying and try not to make the maintainer feel bad by what you say. Uh, so in, I'm, I'm all for plus one, I'm all for bump, uh, that's fine. Or even like, this is, this is a really cool change, uh, I'd love to see it, that's great. Notice how it's a positive tone. When you say something like uh, on this one, um, you know, why hasn't this been merged yet? All of a sudden, myself as a maintainer feels accused, like I am unjust for not merging this ticket. So be careful with those. Uh, the next one is the dung heap. These are very easy to identify. Uh, it's a, a pull request or a patch with a thousand lines of changed code, zero description, it breaks automated tests, uh, has 20 or 30 commits if it's on GitHub, doesn't follow the coding style, uh, and these, these are usually pretty easy to just close right away, but sometimes the person gets offended when you close it and then it takes maybe a few hours of your time cumulatively to teach them the process. But these aren't the worst because a lot of times people who do these, you can teach them, like here's how you actually do it. Uh, next is the diamond in the rough. These are a lot of times uh, the same thing as a dung heap except there's one change, usually in the middle of the commit history, and it's usually tied in seven different places in code, just enough that it's hard for you to pull it out, where there's one really good change mixed with three or four bad changes, or three or four changes that you don't want to approve yet. Uh, and these are often also combined with a ghostwriter, uh, because somebody dumps the change in, you say, I just want this thing, can you change it? And you never hear from them again. And then after a few months, uh, a few for shamers pop in the queue and start asking why it hasn't been merged. Uh, next is the imposter. Uh, these are when, when you meet somebody at DrupalCon and you shake their hand and then uh, they tell you about their, their life story and then they realize that, that you're a sucker for helping people. So they'll post in your issue queue something not entirely related, related to your project just because they know that you're going to help them. Uh, so those are the imposters. Usually I'll, I'll ask them to email me directly or something. It's, you know, the issue queues aren't the place for asking general help often. Then there's the black hole. Uh, these issues, um, I have a, a very pertinent example. Uh, who here has seen uh, the issue about the Drupalcon and Drupal Core, changing the Drupalcon? Okay, so a couple people have. Uh, this issue has been open, I think, for four or five years. It started off saying, uh, the Drupalcon disappeared from Drupal's installer. Let's update it and refresh it for a new Millennium look. And uh, uh, what is it, 380 comments or so later, we're still on square one saying, let's, let's figure out a way to update this. These are the issues where it's, it's a simple task or a simple change, uh, but a few conflicting opinions turn it into a uh, maybe you know four to 20 year ordeal, and Drupal has plenty of these. Uh, they often devolve into bike sheds. So uh, a bike shed is when people, you, you want a bike and you're about to deliver the bike, but then three or four people start arguing over what color to paint it, uh, something like that. It's, it, there's something about a shed, but basically it's an issue that goes forever. <laughs> so whether or not you know who Dory is, um, if, you have, if you have kids, I'm sure you do. If you don't have kids, then uh, you, you probably have at least seen Dory somewhere or another. Uh, she's a fish with a, a problem with short-term memory loss, and uh, she's a very optimistic character, though, and, and she's a good... She has a good reminder for us to just keep swimming. If you feel like you're drowning in your issue cues, um, you can keep swimming with some of these tips that I have. That's, that's as far as that analogy goes. Sorry, if you're expecting a whole Finding, Finding Nemo chain of, of slides here. Um, one, of the, one of the things that helps me a lot is uh, to add some personality to my projects. Uh, so if you were at DrupalCon, I think, a year or two ago, I don't remember which one it was, I brought my little Raspberry Pi cluster with me. 
I called it the Pi Dramble. So I gave it a name. That was one little thing that helped me to relate to it. It's not like the Raspberry Pi Drupal cluster. It's a Dramble. I made the term, and it means something about like if you're like drugged up and stumbling around, but that's not the definition I was using. Um, but I gave it a logo, too, and, and once I did that, I, I was like, it has a name, it has a face, and uh, it, it's something that I feel, it, it's very under the surface, but I feel attached to it in some way. And other people have, have kind of responded a little bit. When you, have, when you have a logo or a name or any kind of branding at all, it can really help, help your project to, uh, to be relatable, and people will kind of, uh, sometimes you can fall in love with it. I, people have fallen in love with Drupal through the DrupalCon, I'm sure. Uh, except I just noticed it was half deflated out there, poor guy. Um, uh, but another thing you can do is uh, build some, some informal branding guidelines. Uh, Drupal VM was something, I, I started it three or four years ago, and it was actually called the Drupal Development Virtual Machine or something like that. Then I realized that's quite a mouthful. It's, it's not really easy to, to roll off the tongue or anything. Uh, so I, I spent a little bit of time, once, once there were a few other people using it, I was like, I, I want to have this be something and not just a thing on GitHub. Uh, so I said it's instead of the Drupal development VM or the Drupal VM, I said it is Drupal VM. And I use it in sentences as a noun. Drupal VM is this and that. So I can relate to it just like with the Raspberry Pi Dramble. And I also uh, kind of, I, there's no branding guidelines in my repository or anything, but I, informally I have a rule of it's always capital D for Drupal space VM. And doing that has added some consistency. It makes the project look a little more polished. Uh, and I added, a, it's, it's not a very good logo, but it's, it's something. Whenever you see Drupal VM, that's, you know, there's a star with it, and stars are happy and stuff, I guess. I'm not a logo designer, so I don't know the psychology of things. It's just, I thought it looked nice. Um, but it, it, it is good. It, it, people, people know that it's Drupal VM by the fact that it's consistent. Um, there are a lot of other projects, too. Uh, the ones, that I, the, the ones that you feel like that could be good, it's, a lot of times it's because there is a brand, there's a logo, there's, there's some meaning behind it. Um, I see you got your Doxel shirt. Like, when I first saw it, I'm like, man, that must be really good. I, I didn't even try it or anything, but it's like there's a shirt and there's a, there's a D with a thing. You know, it's, it, it is something, it is nice. Um, it is something that's, that's helpful. Another thing, um, I was actually reminded of this yesterday. So here's another tie-in with finding, the, uh, finding Dore, I guess, you know, short-term memory loss. Um, uh, yesterday in a Composer boff, uh, so I had mentioned something about uh, something with Composer and how it's, it's ruining our lives and all that kind of stuff. Um, I actually do like Composer, so don't quote me on that. Um, anyway, I, I said something about it, and somebody said, oh, yeah, there's this issue. And I'm like, oh, really? I didn't know that. And then uh, he said, oh, yeah, it's issue, whatever. He found it. And I scrolled down, and I had the most recent comment two years ago or two uh, months ago, if it was two years ago, it'd be fine. But, um, and I'm reminded pretty much on a weekly basis, sometimes daily when I'm really working on something, uh, that, uh, it, I mean, this is open source. Uh, it, it, open is a very important part of it. And when you're developing on something or when you're changing something, if you want to have other people be involved, and if you want to remember what you did, because you know, 1.5 hours is not a lot of time to do a large change. So a lot of times you'll start something one day, and then two weeks later get to pick it back up. Uh, if you keep your notes somewhere that is not, is not able to be easily found or Googleable or anything like that, uh, or if you don't put down any notes at all, it's gonna be really hard to have a long-term history of maintaining something. Uh, so. I always, like, if I'm going to work on something, even if it's, I mean, if it's like a one-line change, I might not open an issue for it. But anything bigger, I'll open an issue, I'll put the problem, I'll put the proposed solution, uh, I'll do the work, and I'll push up a patch or uh, on GitHub put a pull request up against it. That way, uh, if I'm not finished with it, uh, then someone else could take it. And uh, if I need to come back to it in two or three weeks, or you know, some things it's like six months later, I have the context, I don't have to spend the time. So as an open source maintainer, even if I'm contributing to my own project, I treat myself like uh, one of the contributors. If I, don't, if I don't give myself the context and uh, the information that I need to continue something. Uh, the, other, the other benefit of that is uh, if I ever look on Stack Overflow or Drupal Answers or something and I see an answer 
that's like pretty good but not perfect, I'll comment on it, leave the comment there. Uh, or if I find a, a question that's not answered after five years and I found the answer, I will go back there and spend a little time answering it because inevitably a year or two later, I'll have the exact same issue again. I'll search it on Google and I'll be like, oh yeah, that, that's exactly what I need to do. Oh, I wrote that, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like, it, it, and it, it's, it's not something that means I have a lot more time or anything. It's the same amount of time that I spend either way, whether I document it or not. Um, it, you know, it might take a, a minute or two longer, but the amount of time that saves me in the future and potentially and most likely saves hours or hundreds or thousands of hours throughout the course of history of these open source projects. Um, so, so try to work in the open. Uh, oh, and, and one other thing too is my blog, like a lot of people ask, uh, how do you have so much time to write these blog posts? Like sometimes it's like one or two a day. Uh, it's because when I'm working on something, I use my blog as my scratch pad. And, and usually I'll, I'll write like the steps that I'm doing something or whatever. I probably have 100 or 200 posts in there that I never finished. It, it's like 20% of the way there, but I never, I never finished that bug or I found something else somewhere else that I could do. Um, uh, but I, I just document as I go. I write a blog post as I go. And a lot of my blog posts aren't like Pulitzer Prize winning reports. It's just, I have this problem and here's how I solved it, step one, step two. A lot of times those posts are posts that, that end up helping people a lot because they, they're having the same problem. They Google it, they find the answer, or you do a year later, which happens all the time. And I put this here just because I like Tesla and no. Uh, there's, there's a reason I put Tesla up here. Uh, they are, right now they're, they're by market capitalization, the largest automotive manufacturer in the world. Uh, or not in the world, in the US, sorry. And um, a lot of people are wondering like, why is that? And, and one answer could be, well, they're, they're an energy company, not a car company. Sort of true, maybe, but um, I think the reason is more, more fundamental and, and something that Elon Musk, who owns Tesla and a lot of other companies, uh, he said that we focus on designing the machine that makes the machine. The fact, uh, they turn the factory into a product. I think that that's a lot more inspirational and, and foundational and the reason why it's a valuable company. Uh, they're not about making batteries, they're not about making cars or semi-trucks or you know, SpaceX isn't only about making rockets. They're about transforming the process so that they can make cars better and so that they can make billions of batteries and they can make things much cheaper. And as open source developers, uh, we're software developers, and uh, in the past five to 10 years, automation has become something that can help accelerate our growth and our ability to do things. Uh, and you know, bringing that way back down to our level, there's, uh, there are a lot of things that we can automate, and, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I have 160 projects and not like one or two. Almost every one of my projects has almost full coverage of automated tests. Like if somebody patch pushes up a pull request, it'll break if it breaks the project. I don't have to every time grab the code and run it locally and do all these manual tests and things. I have some pretty solid assurance that at, at least the main parts of my, my uh, applications and programs and things are all running fine. So automated testing is really important. Another, another great uh, example of this is Drupal itself and Drupal 6 had, I don't think, any tests. Drupal 7 had like 30 or 40 percent test coverage. Drupal 8, I don't, I don't think it's 100 percent, but it's getting there. And Drupal, at least Drupal Core, has been incredibly stable, at least per release. You know, upgrades and things are a little bit different because they're harder to test. But uh, automated tests are essential to uh, maintaining a, a good long-term open source project and being able to refactor things and, and update things and take out chunks of it and put in new things. It's very important. Another practical thing is if you're on GitHub, you can actually add an issue underscore template file in a .github folder. Uh, in the presentation later, I'll, I'll have a link to it, um, but uh, the link to the documentation. But you can put in there some of the things like a lot of those, like the for shamer and the, you know, the, the dung heap and all those, uh, a lot of those things can be prevented by just having a couple simple instructions. So, you know, please, you can put in this template like, delete this line and put what OS you're using, or delete this line and put what browser you're using, little things like that. Because a lot of times issue queues get clogged up by issues that don't have all the facts available. 
and you know you, you ask for the facts, and then of course it's a ghostwriter, so you're never going to see the facts. But if you ask for them up front like that, uh, people will people will put them in. And on Drupal.org right now, there's no way to do that kind of in the body template. The, there there is a way to like add a message above the form or something, but nobody ever reads that. So uh, I should probably open an issue to ask for an issue template thing for Drupal.org. Uh, another thing that's important to me is my email filters. Every single open source related thing, whether it's a GitHub notification or Drupal.org or any of that kind of stuff, it all goes into an inbox or a separate mailbox, and that mailbox is not included with my unread count. If it were, I would never get to any of the open source stuff, and it would interfere with all my other stuff. So, uh, you know, we have enough email as it is. But one thing that I do like to do is I still have all my projects notifications sent to my email. That way, uh, when I'm starting my work every day on open source, I can at least click on the bottom one and like go up, up, up and, and look through each one to see is there anything critical. Like if there's, if there's somebody reporting like I installed this and my database is gone, I will take a look at those pretty quickly. But other than that, I'll just see like what's something, is there anything interesting? Are there any PRs that look like they have a good description and all that? And I'll go ahead and merge those. That's another reason why you should always put a good description uh, with your issues and pull requests. And finally, um, I mentioned Doxel earlier, and, uh, and Drupal VM to a certain extent is similar in this. Uh, you need to have tools that will help you to get your project running very quickly. And Docker is a great tool to help with that nowadays. Uh, if, if it takes you more than maybe five to 10 minutes at the maximum to set up your project and get it running and put a patch on it or pull down a pull request or something, if it takes longer than that, then that 1.5 hours of time is gonna be a waste. It's going to take you longer just to deal with your local environment uh, to re reproduce something. So always have, always have an issue template if you can. Uh, always add automated tests. Uh, find a way to make your infrastructure quick to set up and uh, add some email filters. That's, those are the four ways I mostly automate all my projects. There's some other things you can do too, um, but that's, that's what I do. Uh, the next important thing, and the reason why we're all here today, is we're a community of people that use Drupal or that are affected by Drupal in some way. Um, and as, as your project starts getting more popular, you'll have to interact with people. Well, you'll get to. I'm an introvert, so I say you'll have to interact with people. Um, but there's, there's some things that are important to do. One of, one of the things that uh, basically the only reason I've been able to continue working with some of my projects is there are some people uh, I'm calling them fans. It's not like they're a fan of me or my thing necessarily. Usually it's people that need your, need your thing to work, so they're, they want it to work well, and they'll help you. You need to connect to them, connect with them, and uh, make them allies. So not just fans and not just people that like your thing, but you want to see, see what they need, see what they want, um, start working with them. A lot of times, like for instance with Drupal VM, there's, there's three or four people. Two of them are now maintainers uh, alongside me. Uh, they, they have consistently shown that they, they have a good issue, um, they have pull requests that have all four of those criteria I was talking about earlier, and they've been consistently coming back into the issue queue. You can start seeing that pattern after you know, 10 or 20 issues total in a project, and, and then if you, let, if you give them more, uh, if you enable them to do more things, then a lot of times they'll start doing more than you can do. And, uh, and that's, that's one way that like in terms of the Drupal project, we, we have a bunch of core committers and we have hundreds or thousands of core patch submitters and people can come and people can go and it's, it's not, it doesn't break anything because we have a strong community. And a lot of that is because people got attached to Drupal or people needed Drupal and we kind of work together. Another thing that's important uh, is giving people uh, fake internet points, otherwise known as karma. Uh, open source is, for the most part, a volunteer-driven effort. I'm not paid for anything I do with Drupal VM. I'm not paid for anything with Ansible, except I have a way of getting some money back through my book, I guess. But um, money, when money's not actually available, uh, the gratitude is, is a, the currency that we have for open source. And gratitude is something that makes people feel better about themselves and it makes you feel better for thanking them and, and having that relationship. So give them karma through uh, mentioning them on Twitter, 
uh, putting in the change log, you can say thanks to this person. Um, you know, if, if, there's, if there's somebody that is working for a company that's using your open source project and the company is giving them time, thank the company. Uh, and be, be very flattering because you know, that's why I do open source, because I want to feel better about myself. Um, so if you flatter people, they will, I'm only kidding a little bit about that. Uh, but if you flatter people, they, they will feel better about doing work for your project. And um, you know, if, if you don't flatter them, a lot of times they, you know, there's, there's not a lot of personal incentive to keep doing the things that they do. Uh, and, and we've seen this in the Drupal community as we've started incentivizing some, some things like contributions and you see your profile has, has more, uh, like more commits and more projects and documentation statistics and things. People will do things just to get that little uh, endorphin rush. Uh, another thing, which is uh, fairly pertinent at this period in our, in our Drupal community, but um, I'm not going to deal with any particular issues right now. Um, I, I take a philosophy of, to any extent possible, avoiding any drama. A lot of times drama comes up and it's usually between a person and someone else or a person and some code or something like that. Most of the time, if you don't step in as a maintainer, if you don't step into the particular situation, it will resolve itself. Uh, sometimes you do have to step in. When you do, make sure you take a lot of time uh, and don't ever, like, I have a rule for myself, if there's something that's going on or, you know, if there's some sort of uh, issue, unless it's, like, dangerous, uh, I will have a 24-hour rule of I won't respond to it, I won't even, you know, I'll, I'll think about it a little bit, I'll try to, I might try to communicate with somebody outside of the issue queues really quick just to see, like, hey, you know, this happened, are you aware of it, that kind of thing, um, but I will not respond to it until 24 hours have passed, just because all of us, you know, we're all human, and we all have knee-jerk reactions, and we all bring our, our own, uh, we bring our own issues into these situations. So uh, giving it that day time to, to simmer a little bit lets you have a bit of a clearer head. Um, and a nice thing that we have in the Drupal community is uh, a lot of other support that we can use to help us to reason through things. and, and you know, one of the hard things is it, it, drama always takes a lot of time to, um, to resolve. And a lot of people are not very patient, especially when you're used to software and, and getting things done quickly or, you know, the code speaks and all that kind of stuff. But it, it takes a long time to heal wounds or to uh, resolve differences, that kind of thing. So um, I, I guess the, the, best, the best thing that I have to say about it uh, after that 24 hours is, is what you're saying going to be helpful? If it's going to be helpful, sure, go ahead and do it. If it's not going to be helpful, maybe you need another 24 hours. Uh, or maybe you need to take a short sabbatical and, and stay away from the situation and, and let your users know that. Um, and uh, some, of these, some of the things that I've been talking about are summed up or written about much more eloquently in some of these posts. The, the third one is one that I wrote earlier this year, or I guess last year. I still think it's 2016. Um, uh, but one of, the, one of the things that's really been invaluable is a, a cool new guide that uh, GitHub set up, that top link, and the links will be in this session's URL on Drupal.org. Uh, they, they have a series of guides, like guides for contributors, guides for maintainers, guides for uh, uh, people who are just using the software, guides for businesses using open source. Uh, they're really good. Like I, I don't know how they put them together, uh, but I saw them one day and I'm like, this is actually like, this is great. Uh, I, if I wanted to, I could have just pulled off some of that information and presented it to you and acted like I thought of it myself. Uh, but anyway, these are all some, some good links. Um, but really, in general, what, what this whole presentation comes down to, uh, you know, there's a lot of things in community, a lot of things that are, um, that are, are things that you share with other people, but especially if you're a maintainer, but even if you're just, not just, uh, contributors are important people. Uh, if you're a maintainer, a contributor, or, or somebody that's just involved in like, using software and, and being part of the community, uh, the most important thing of all of it, since we're human and since we have needs and desires and things outside of our open source work, uh, is that uh, you need to know that when you say yes to others, you need to make sure you're not saying no to yourself. 
and thank you. So I wanted to end there and leave some time for discussion because I'm, I'm sure that there are other people that have really good insights. You know, these are the things that work for me, but um, what are some things that work for other people? Uh, and also, you can ask any questions. Just don't be an imposter and ask me about Drupal VM right now. <laughs> Anybody? No? Yeah. Oh, yeah, can you use the microphone for the benefit of the people who will be watching this in 20 or 30 years? Of course. Uh, so, when, so when you spend an hour and a half per day, is it an hour and a half per weekday, or, or are your weekends a completely different schedule? It depends. Uh, I've, I didn't mention, but like, you know, some days, some days that can become two or three hours. Like if, I'm, if I hit a flow state, uh, then I'm going to tell my wife that she can watch the TV show on her own or you know, whatever, and I'm just going to finish that issue. That might happen once a week, maybe maybe once every other week. But usually it's about an hour to two hours. And uh, I, do, I do generally do things on weekends too. Uh, that's, I mean, it, for me, it, it, like I said, and it's, it's partially true that I get kind of an endorphin rush out of doing things open source. That's the reason a lot of people do things like this. So uh, I, I usually do something on weekends, uh, Saturday and, and sometimes Sunday night, but I also trade that off by sometimes on a weekday if I had, if we did a lot of crazy things at work or something and I'm kind of stressed or if, you know, kids can be kids and sometimes you have a really stressful evening, I'll just watch something on Netflix for three hours instead of 30 minutes. So I'll just binge a little bit. Could you talk about uh, how you work writing in there? Yes. So uh, that's a good question because um, the book is something that was completely out of this flow for me. I, I decided it was, it was, I think, starting before I started working for Acquia. It was in a very strange time of my life because I started working for Acquia. I had, a, had our second child um, and was getting this, like, working in a new way with a new team and all that. Uh, and I was like, yeah, and I'll write a book too. Um, and that's also when Drupal VM started becoming a little bit more popular, so I had more, more time to have to maintain it. Uh, I, I did that, and, and this is also where my, my Crohn's disease kind of comes into the equation. I wasn't, for some crazy good reason, I wasn't having any symptoms or any issues with it, so I decided to wake up at about 5 a.m. every morning, and I wrote from about 5 to 6. And so I had that time in the morning, and I did the time an hour or two at, at night, uh, working on writing. And then the cool thing about the book is, and, and for anybody who does a lot of open source work, or even if you do a lot of work with a certain technology, uh, if, there's, if there's something that's good to write about and you like writing or something, uh, you can actually use your book to work on cool things for the project, and you can use your project as an, a source of examples and infer inspiration for the book. So a lot of times I'd spend an hour or two writing in the morning. Uh, the dog is asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for putting your dog to sleep. There you go. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll, spend, I'll spend an hour or two writing something in the morning, and then I'll be implementing that, or I'll, I'll be expanding the work that I did to support that writing that night. Uh, so unfortunately, it was... Crohn's has been, it's always, I mean, anybody who has Crohn's or any of those kind of uh, inflammatory diseases, it's a constant struggle. I haven't had that kind of availability uh, because of that for the past year or two. So, um, you know, use the time that you get wisely and, and schedule things and, and try, to, try to control those aspects and, and you can do things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, prioritizing things that are work from family is kind of one thing. Prioritizing work from open source where there's so much overlap can be pretty challenging. How do you deal with that? Well, I work for Acquia, which is, I'm fortunate to have a company that I mean, open source is at the core of what we do. Like we, we do a lot of Drupal and, and a lot of people here are in the same boat. So, um, you know, open source work is part of our day job. And, 
Um, you know, there's, it's not always money, but sometimes there is money involved too, or there is uh, some, some people who can work on a project either full-time or part-time. And uh, some things that I do with Drupal VM are like, I can work on it during the day, like Windows support. It's not, I don't do uh, Windows things out of the charity of my heart. I do them because people ask me uh, with dollar signs to do things like that. Um, so I think that uh, it can be harder to separate things. If you, if you do it when you're working and then you carry that over into night, it, you have this blurred line of work versus open source. And uh, especially if your work is difficult or challenging or something, you can, you can bring those things into your open source and then that can cause burnout too. So I, I try, and I'm not perfect at this, but I try like in an event like DrupalCon, I'll, I'll try to completely separate the work out and just focus on community and open source and the hallway track and those kind of things. Uh, because they're, they're the things that keep me attracted to open source, not, not what I do at work. And, and if, if my work is ever making my open source stuff not as fun or interesting or something, that's, that's going to be hard. And a lot of people fall into that situation, though. So don't have a great answer for you. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so m maybe this is not an issue for you. It's kind of dependent on personalities involved. But like, how do you make sure that your family realizes that you, you, know, you have a lot of individual pursuits that may not directly involve them? How, how do you keep them realizing that you, you know, you're not putting those pursuits over them. Yeah. Well, it, when you have young children, they don't, they don't know a whole lot anyways. But, <laughs> but no, it, it, that's, it's important. Like, I think that family, uh, for, for anybody that has a, uh, even if you just have a girlfriend or boyfriend or significant other of any type, uh, but especially if you also have children and young children especially, they, they, don't, see the, they don't see that it's like something that you that really fulfills you or makes you feel good. And you have, to, you have to share that passion with them somewhat. Like, my wife knows what Drupal is, and she even knows the Drupal song. Um, and my son can sing the Drupal song for you. Uh, but they don't, like, they, they don't have that same, same motivation. They, you know, I don't think my wife cares too much about whether something's open source or not. Uh, but I, I, I tell her about it. I, um, you know, I check in with her when I'm at these events. and. Uh, it's it's also something where like at night it, I think it's something that's your personality too. Like at nighttime, we'll usually sit together and I'll I'll be on my laptop and it's you know we we aren't necessarily talking to each other or something at that time, but we will also do other things throughout the day and um, like that four hour family time that I have it is family time. Like I don't have I have my work laptop in the basement and I don't touch it once my you know once it's five o'clock or something that stays down there. And uh, I usually don't don't even open up my laptop or iPad or anything until the kids are asleep. So, it's they see that I have family as a major priority because outside of my work hours, family is what I do. So, I think it's it's mostly just showing them that you can be fully devoted to family and you can have a strong devotion to other activities and passions too. And I, I teach my kids too. Like if they if they like something, we will support them in trying to explore that further, like playing a piano or uh, not hitting each other or biting each other, but, you know. Mm -hmm. um, do you or, or have you ever had the temptation to uh, sort of want to use delegation as a management, you know, to manage the, the overwhelming number of issues and stuff? And could you talk a little bit about benefits and drawbacks of get, handing over control to other people? Yeah. Well, I am uh, I'm like the case study in uh, Not Invented Here. So uh, sometimes it, it's hard for me to delegate, I guess, because a lot of times these projects are like my babies. Um, and, but, but like something like Drupal VM or uh, my Ansible book or some things like that, larger projects can't succeed if I'm the only one touching them. So the first level is, and everybody should be able to do this, is somebody submits a patch and, and you'll work with them on that patch. The second level is, having people, like giving them a little bit more control, saying you can, you can close issues or you can label things. And then the third level is you're a maintainer. Like I trust you to make decisions on your own. And I think it's just learning to trust other people and having the ability to trust other people. Some people aren't necessarily able to do that. Um, and 
the sad thing is a lot of those projects will never become what they could be because one person, like I, I really believe, like one person can't make an entire product that is cohesive and complete. One person can do some awesome things and, and do libraries and things like that and, or do a, an aspect of a product really well, but it takes, it takes a community to build major things like Drupal and like Drupal VM. I've probably, at this point, I probably only have touched half of the code base. A lot of people have contributed a lot of code. Um, and a lot of people have also found ways to delete a lot of code, which is even better. And that's something that I wouldn't do necessarily, uh, but somebody else shows like you can do it better this way. Um, so it, I think if it's a small project, you can still keep it on your own. Or if it's something that, that's uh, something easily forkable, you wouldn't need to necessarily delegate. But once you, if you want to grow at all, you have to start delegating. And for Drupal VM, it was it was only six or eight months before I gave someone else access to control issues and things. And then it it, it was a year or so before I gave Oscar. Schildstrom, I, I'm trying to pronounce his name right. Uh, he's he's been like super awesome. He's uh, he was one of the early guys who I'm like, man, he keeps just giving me these great pull requests, and he keeps responding to these issues with great follow-ups and things like that. So um, I gave him maintainer access, and he's he's been like he probably does more. Uh, it's not a sad thing; it's a good thing, I guess. He probably does more coding work on on Drupal VM at this point than I do. I just look at his things and I'm like, accept, accept. So, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned uh, you you are having 160 open source projects. So where do you start? Like these are the tools you use on daily basis, which you you want to make it open source, or as for, for a new contributor, where do you start uh, open sourcing stuff? That's that's a good question. I. Uh, a few years ago, I started deciding, like, basically, I'm not going to do any closed source things for anything that I work on. Now, obviously, for, for work, there are things that I do that aren't open source. But at this point, like, if I'm uh, building a new type of server for something or if I'm changing uh, one of the services I run, like hosted solar or server check-in or something, I'll first work on abstracting something into a library or a module or something, put that up, and then I'll start working on getting it uh, working for my application. And there's two good reasons for that. One is it's open source and it can help other people, but it's also a selfish reason. Uh, I don't have the time to spend to make things better and fix things and all that for all these projects. So if they're open source, other people do that work for me. Uh, some of them, you know, there's never been a, a, nobody's hit the star button and nobody's posted any issues. But even so, I, if you check the stats on any GitHub, uh, anything that's been on GitHub for more than six months or a year, there's at least a few people cloning it or uh, coming from Google search or something like that. So it's, it, that comes back to working in the open. Like for me, Google is my notepad. I just, I just make sure everything's indexable and then I can find it later. <laughs> it's better than like having a giant notebook or something because I, I would never be able to search that. Any other questions? Yeah. So I first would like to thank you for your blog efforts because uh, that was very, very helpful and inspirational for me as well as a maintainer because when we started using Ansible in, in, in the beginning. Uh, my question is how did you start with that? Like is it, is it just that you realized at some point that it's much easier to keep your, all your notes and just open source your notes? Uh, or did, did you spend some time kind of realizing that? Because you mentioned you are an introvert, mm -hmm. right? So, but online you are actually extrovert. So, how did you convert from one to the other one? I, I think it was just, it, it's it's mostly I think related to the imposter syndrome of when I started working with Drupal. Drupal was the first open source project I ever touched, and um, I think I went to DrupalCon Chicago and realized like these people I saw online who were very prolific and the smartest people ever. They were shy just like me, some of them, not everybody, of course. Uh, and I was like, they're human. This is, this is amazing. And so, so then I, I started to, um, I had been blogging like just random things for a few years before that, but it, I had never had anyone really see it or do anything with it. And so I was kind of used to writing stuff that would be out there. Uh, but when I realized that other people were like me, uh, that, that, kind of just changed my perspective of this stuff isn't perfect and it might not 
might not work everywhere. It might not even be like the right thing or whatever, but I can still share it and somebody might get something out of it. But like I said, I usually end up getting something out of it later. Uh, so I think it was overcoming the imposter syndrome, not to think that I'm, I'm not an imposter, but knowing that everybody's in the same boat and uh, I have valuable stuff that people will appreciate no matter what, what it's related to. Uh, and even if nobody ever appreciates it, I, you know, it, it's just, it's no skin off my back to write something or publish something or do whatever, uh, as long as I feel like it was something that, that was good to do or, or felt good about or whatever. It's, I don't know. I mean, a lot of it is just I like to share. And uh, for an introvert especially, I don't like sharing in a public space as much. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, it, it's hard to be comfortable in a big party or something, uh, but I, I find that on the computer and online and stuff, I can share a little easier because I don't have to like talk to people and stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Looks like there's nothing else. So uh, have a good last session, and I'll see you at the closing session. And also, if you want to review this and give me like five stars out of five for everything. I just wanted to say hi and thanks. I've looked a lot of that. But, um, and also, I see myself in a bunch of